So thank you so much for being here with us. Um, yeah. You study the relationship between technology politics and society around the world and especially yeah. uh, through the UCLA Digital Cultural Lab which you founded and you explore how context and I quote culture and community shape the way in which technology is used and understood across the world so yeah. what I get from that is that technologies are definitely subjective Yeah, technologies are certainly not neutral, and the reason why is because human beings create them, right? Yeah. And when we create technologies, just like we create anything, when we write something, when we design something, we always create it based on who we are, right? So, exactly. So now we're at this moment where we have a couple billion people in the world, well, we have about four to five mm -hmm. billion people in the world using the internet, and we have three or so billion, two to three billion people using single technologies that are created in one part of the world but exactly. have globalized. So then the question comes, is there a disconnect between how the technologies are created or even how the technologies learn yeah. from the world and the people that are actually using it? Yeah, because you said that um, uh, technology actually reflects the way the creators see the world. Often, and yeah. when we think about learning technologies, generally speaking, they learn from the parts of the world where there's more content online, which tends to be the parts of the world where the internet already has come, and the parts of the world with higher you know, levels of connectivity and higher levels of digital literacy. Yeah. So learning technologies then, therefore, tend to reinforce a lot of the biases of the Western world. And when we speak about the Western world and technology, we're generally talking about Silicon Valley. Yes, of course. And often we're talking about males, men, um, and we're often talking about white men too. Yeah, so, so this ends up creating... The, so, yeah. so yeah, and it's not like they're bad people, but we always create it based on who we are. So if I'm, as a brown man, if I were based in India, even though I'm from the US, and I built a technology from India that billions of other people would mm -hmm. use, it would be important also to include those other voices as well. So it's not a unique problem about those people. It's a problem it's a of asymmetry of power over design of technology and how the technologies learn. It's an asymmetry. And do you have like a few uh, concrete examples yeah. of how it, it affects our digital experience? Yeah, it's, I, I gave several yesterday. So, um, you know, I'll give you just two quick ones sure. that I was describing yesterday. So one of them was looking at a system that's being built in the United States that's being used in courtrooms yeah. for court sentencing. So what that means is the system looks at the file of a criminal report and it makes a decision on the risk of that person to commit another crime in the yeah. future. And based on that risk, it makes a decision on how long the sentence should be. The problem is, is we're learning that those systems are having massive biases against black people. Mm -hmm. And the reason why isn't because the system asks someone if they're black or not, but it asks a number of questions about poverty when they're growing up mm -hmm. or what their neighborhood is or if their parents had trouble with the, with, the, yeah. with, the, with the court system or police system. And it's making decisions based on that. So what is actually happening is that some variables are being, uh, are being optimized for and other variables are not. And as a result, if you're someone who you know, maybe did something small, you could end up getting a worse risk based on who you are rather than what you did. Yeah. That's <laughs> so that's a yeah. big issue. So that's a first example I yeah. gave. A second example I gave was systems that we're building to automate for human resources work. Like, mm -hmm. So, you know, we're building automated systems, automation technologies, um, not simply for truck driving or for taxi driving or for agricultural labor or industrial labor. And all of those are being built right now. Yeah. And they're coming. They're already kind of here. Uber is doing automated cars. Um, Tesla is doing the same. Um, we're also building systems for white-collar work. So people who might work in human resources jobs and decide which CVs we're going to accept, yes. who we're going to yeah. interview. And those systems are using algorithms that are scanning text mining CVs from applicants to make decisions on who gets to the final round yeah. from maybe 200 applicants or 300 applicants to 10 finalists, right? So this is the most difficult part because it's very difficult to get to the final round. How do we know how they make decisions? Yes. And what they're finding is, again, with technology, science, and engineering positions, those algorithmic systems are having massive biases for men versus women because, again, those systems are learning from the world and are reinforcing the biases that see women as not good at science, as not good at technology. So what is actually, and, and their systems are also having issues with um, 
with with again minorities yes. like black people yeah. and so on. And so that's because the world of technology as it is is already generally male and not necessarily black people overall, right? So those systems are actually making decisions based on the world as it is, but our world as it is is not perfect. In fact, it's of far course. from perfect. We have to, but that's okay for it to not be perfect. We have to use technologies to allow our world to be become better and more inclusive and more equitable and more democratic yep. not less and not use those technologies to actually make the biases of our world more normal that's the other issue people treat technologies as neutral as morally neutral that's a big myth yeah. that has always existed and it, maybe it's morally neutral to have a wheel or to use a pencil but that's not the same with the computational technology that sure. replaces human resources work so sometimes when i raise these concerns um, and, and I mentioned this yesterday in my speech mm. when I presented here at USI. Um, people say, well, this is better than a judge that's racist or a human resources worker who thinks women are not good at science and technology. And I said, that's the wrong question. The question isn't which one of these two is better. The question is, is what kind of world do we want? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, shouldn't the technologies yeah. be helping us create the world we want? And so ultimately, it's not really a question about technology. It's a question about who we want to be ourselves. in yeah. our societies, in France, in the United States. I mean, look at us in the United States. We're having so many problems even coming together because we have so many political divisions, yeah. right? And maybe it's true here in a smaller way, I guess. So how do, how do we address this issue? So how do we feed the algorithm with something less biased? Yeah, there's a few, three or four things we need to do. First of all, the teams that are developing those systems need to be more inclusive. Yeah. They should have people like yourself, myself, mm -hmm. the people that are actually affected, the people from those communities that are affected, uh, like women applicants to engineering jobs, yeah. should be part of the design process of algorithms that make selections about all jobs. Right, including those jobs. Yeah. So that's first. It's inclusion in the in the design in the process. process. Yeah. Second is how those systems learn. So the data they learn from needs to be more equitable and balanced mm -hmm. and not the existing biases of the world. That's second. And third is we need to audit those systems. Audit meaning we need to check those systems. What are they doing? What are they not doing? And not wait till it's too late yeah. when we see people getting criminal sentences or more and more women being excluded from the engineering mm -hmm. profession because the systems are supposedly neutral. But it's not that the systems are not neutral, it's that we're not neutral in our existing world, so we have to do our best mm -hmm. to push toward more equity. Yeah. Uh, in, your, in your book, The Global Village, um, yeah. you said the new technology revolution is neither global nor cross-cultural. Can we go a bit further about the cross-cultural yeah. parts. Well, think about it. 99.9% .9 of the users of a Google technology or a Facebook technology or even Amazon, Alibaba, etc. Yeah. technologies don't come from the part of the world where those technologies were created, right? It's kind of incredible. Think about this. How the five biggest technology companies in the world, if you don't include the Chinese ones, yeah. Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Google, and of course Facebook, Facebook yeah are all in the exact same part of the world. The world yeah. In fact, four of them are in the Silicon Valley yeah. area, and the fifth, Amazon, is just about 800 miles north in mm. Seattle, but has offices in the, in the Silicon Valley. Mm. How is it that there wasn't a French competitor on that, that scale emerged. to yeah. any of them, any of them, mm. right? Or how is it that it, this didn't happen in Germany, or in Canada, or in Mexico, or in India, right? How did that happen? So that actually means that even if those companies are full of wonderful people, and I have friends who work in these companies, yeah. and a lot of them are very good people. I spoke at Google three weeks ago raising these concerns, and I was surprised. I thought people would be upset at me. They agreed with me. Mm -hmm. So what we have is a disconnection between those that claim connectivity, the people that are connecting us are actually disconnected, not because it's their fault, but because they're in that part of the world, right? Mm -hmm. So this is what I mean is, this is what I mean, it's not a global or cross-cultural revolution. Of course, our uses of technology are global and cross-cultural. Mm -hmm. And we see many examples that are very powerful and inspiring of people innovating on the ground in places in Africa, in places in South Asia, in places in Mexico yeah, where exactly, I do my work. In, in and that is important yeah. too, right? Um, but overall on a macro kind of geopolitical mm. or economic level, there is a disconnect here. 
And that's a concern. So my new book is building on those ideas and talking about what we need to do about these algorithmic biases. What do we need to do about automation? How do we ensure that, it's, that our world of new technology is balanced? And so, uh, talking about the, this example that you had in Mexico, uh, they built autonomous infrastructures. Yeah. Could that be a solution? Do we need to think really globally about the internet yeah. and then spread it? And yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I think it's important that we have to do everything we can to focus the governance of technology more on the ground. Mm -hmm. Um, it doesn't have to be quite as extreme as that. I get. I yeah. understand that. That's like these are very specific, small examples. Yesterday in my talk, I spoke about mesh network technology. Yeah. So in parts of the world where connectivity has not been provided, people create their own forms of connectivity. In Detroit, in the United States, they've done it. There's a huge network in um, in Catalonia called GuifiNet. Yeah. Um, and what that means is in those projects, just like my work in Mexico, which yeah. is com indigenous community-owned cell phone technology, the largest community-owned cell phone network in the world is in the Oaxaca region of Mexico, where I've been spending time. Mm -hmm. um, in all of those cases, the people that run the project have more power over deciding who gets jobs, who's invested in mm -hmm. the community, what values it supports, what values it doesn't support. They can more, they can take care, they can have custodianship guardianship mm -hmm. of the project. So I think that's one important initiative, mm -hmm. but I think on a macro level, we have to just ensure that those big companies give us some power, give us some control, and the minimum give us some visibility. We have to be able to see transparency into why mm -hmm. we're seeing the world as it is. Because this is creating huge problems politically as well, right? So like, say we are sitting right next to each other, we're both Americans. I mean, you're not American, but I say we're both <laughs> Americans. And I am a Donald Trump supporter, and you're a Hillary Clinton supporter. And we both log on to Facebook. What you're going to see is going to be completely yeah, different. different. Yeah. And that's not just because of who you're connected to, but because of how the algorithms are suggesting mm -hmm. content for you. Mm -hmm. So that is, means that's a huge problem for a democracy. Yes. Huge important. problem. And so it's not really about even this Cambridge Analytica, which I, I've been studying for mm -hmm couple of years, etc. It's really about the whole, as I said yesterday, it's a house of cards, you know? The whole system of data and micro-targeting is a house of cards. And I know our a friend from um, Facebook is speaking right now. Next time when you guys do USI, you should have us in dialogue, or not even me, but just people like myself yes, and people sure. like themselves, because they're good people, you know? And I've had these, yeah. but we need to understand and, and one idea is not to put all the responsibility on Facebook, but to make sure Facebook works with other. We can create more jobs. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Create jobs mm -hmm. for yourself, for myself, people who are helping ensure fairness and transparency mm -hmm. and equity in machine learning. You know, we need to kind of think about these new industries to ensure that we're socially balanced. Yes, yeah. because we can understand that Facebook and Google wants to expand, and uh, we yes. we can we can understand also that business pass behind that. So they should yeah. work locally with each country that they want to develop in? Yeah, you know, the, I mean, I was, I was reading some estimates. It was difficult for me to find it. But Facebook, which has over two plus billion users, and that's not considering Instagram and WhatsApp. Yeah. Both are owned by Facebook, right? So that's important to know that. Mm. Uh, people think they're having a different experience, and no, they are on, a, on an ephemeral level, mm. but they aren't on a data-oriented yes. level. The data is going to the same place, mm. right? Um, just like people say, I use YouTube, not Google, but Google owns YouTube, right? So it's naive to think otherwise. But in Facebook's case, I was reading a statistic of a colleague of mine who just released a book that's being reviewed by The Guardian today, told me this, is Facebook's entire global governance team is less than 20 people. Wow. For a company that has two to three billion people users, most of those users, by definition, are not in the United States and Europe because the U.S. only has, I don't know, under 300 million people. Mm -hmm. So even if it was 100% usage, that would be one-seventh, one-eighth so the overall yeah. population. So the places where Facebook wants to expand its user base are the places where, it's, where there are not in the Western world. Mm -hmm. They're places with higher population density, so Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, yeah. It's uh, maybe some parts of Latin America. Mm. But those are places that if, if they're going to expand in those places, they're going to create even more problems in those places. And I gave a lot of examples yesterday of this, mm -hmm. unless they can kind of be more accountable and communicative. 
definitely. And can we say it's yeah. a kind of, and the word is a bit strong, but colonization in some, yeah. some kind? Like imposing I, a Western way to see the world? So, the yeah, no, so for I, I was saying that these concerns about who defines how science functions, yes. how technology functions, I mean, honestly, in a lot of ways, they can be dated back to the Enlightenment itself, right? Mm. Um, in, in theories of knowledge, theories of science, theories. And, and I, I think science and technology are amazing. I'm trained as an engineer myself. I love engineering. But I also know that, generally speaking, we can tie these things in the current day and historically to particular parts of the world that produce those regimes yes. of knowing, right? I mean, and history and philosophy of science, there is a term that, you know, you can edit this out if you want, but it's, you, there's a term that Latour described as an immutable mobile. Immutable means it doesn't change. Yeah. Mobile means it moves, yeah. right? And so the way science functioned is to, it was able to travel by not changing, right? F equals MA, or third law of thermodynamics, mm -hmm. etc. right? These are like laws and they're fixed and that allows them to travel. Mm -hmm. The problem is as something travels from one place to another, it may not make sense as much in those other places. So yeah. that creates those tensions. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I uh, read about that in Who's Global Village. I'm all definitely touching yes. on those issues in this new book as well. Yeah. And what is it called? Uh, I, I need a good title for it. <laughs> um, right now, my, my it's going to be a more mainstream book, All right. um, which I think it's important because it's important for me to not just write academically, but reach the larger world. It's, yes. This is a passion for me, and I care about it very personally, um, having seen this closely. Um, I think we might call it We the Users. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I need a good title, though. Well, I, I think it's pretty good. You think it's good? Okay. I feel concerned when you see that. Yeah, we like the users. Yeah, it's a users. bit American because it's uh, <laughs> it's like the American Constitution starts with we the people. And my book and my work is not. I don't want it to just be about America. About America. No. I just have one last question. Sure. Um, how do you imagine the future of internet? Yeah, I'm actually. Um, I think it's maybe because of the way I am. Um, I'm actually hopeful mm -hmm. because. Thanks to you and other colleagues and the press, I, I have, I've, I, and not just me, there are dozens of us, um, are getting a voice. Yes. And, you know, uh, whether it's justified or not because of this election of Trump, a lot of us who've been making these concerns about the internet mm -hmm. and about new technologies for many years, in a, in a way that's hopefully optimistic too, have been getting a voice. So through conferences like this you know there's a possibility because here are a bunch of people who are actually making those decisions yes and if i can get them to hear me even take 10 percent of what i'm saying and agree with it whichever part they agree they're all very nice people then we can make things happen so i'm hopeful i also think and i don't want to over fetishize it but i also think even in the blockchain space mm -hmm. there's some possibilities to do some positive peer-to-peer -peer exchanges yes without having to go through these surveillance systems in the middle. But I think that we, like other technologies in the past, we're fetishizing blockchain and kind of seeing it just because it's new. We're like, wow. Yes. But what does it apply to? Who governs it? Who profits from it? What does it require? Like, what are the assumptions around connectivity mm -hmm. and infrastructure that it relies upon? All of those are actually almost never answered when mm -hmm. we talk about any technology. And I, and I want to insist that they're answered now before we just kind of go crazy on blockchain. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Nice to meet you. Thank you for very the questions. Nice really good questions.